Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very pleased to see a full house today. My name is Rachel McIntosh. Uh, so as swaths of new investors have entered the market and trading volumes have continued to shoot up, a robust and, secame, sec, excuse me, a robust and secure payment system is more crucial than ever. So in this session today, we have gathered an expert team consisting of users and creators of payment service providers, also known as PSPs, of course. They will discuss us what's coming to PSPs in the near and more distant futures, including innovation and disruption in this part of the fintech industry. So I'll very, I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator today, Victoria Scholtes, the founder of PSP Angels. Yes, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, she's going to be the moderator of, this, moderator of this discussion, and she's also going to introduce the rest of the panelists. So let's welcome them all to the stage. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very excited to be here and uh, talk about this uh, amazing uh, subject. As we know that the payments, I think everybody's uh, weak point at the moment. So I think there's going to be a lot of interesting subjects to uh, to discuss. Um, let me introduce uh, my panelists. Uh, let's start with you, Mike. Uh, with over a decade of extensive experience in the payment and e-commerce sectors, along with several years of entrepreneurship, Mike is leading Expate that offers nearly 80 international payment methods and was recently appointed personal e-commerce advisor of Industro Bank. So give a round of applause to Mike, please. <laughs> also, we have here today Isaac Armoni. Isaac is the chief executive officer at Walter Banking, compliance and legal professional with proven to more than 20 years of track record of success while working for various global companies and banks. Employing his comprehensive experience in venture capital, IT, startup banking, finance, aviation, compliance, and corporate banking, Isaac brings his proven expertise, knowledge, and network to international banks, affiliates, lawyers, and other service providers to Walter. Isaac also holds an LLB and IMBA degrees. So, welcome, Isaac. <laughs> also, we have here today Arthur Azizov. Arthur is the uh, CEO of B2 Broker and a founder of B2 Broker as well, company provider of technology solutions and liquidity for brokerage companies, hedge funds, banks, and all other financial institutions, and B2B InPay, which is a cryptocurrency payment processor. So, welcome here, Arthur. And last but not least, definitely Michael Zhao. Michael is a tech investor and entrepreneur, founder of IDCM, a fiat and crypto trading platform, and VGPay, a blockchain-based ecosystem with payment gateway, white label solutions, crypto custodian service, trading, and wallet so many things. Michael has over 15 years of professional experience and served senior roles in the financial industry with UBS Investment Bank, China Merchant Bank, and Intensa Sao Paulo. Michael is also a former Central Bank of Officer China and Trading Director of Portfolio Manager for the world's largest sovereign fund, which is China's foreign reserve management arm, uh, which has over three trillion dollar assets. Michael is also the co-chairman of Hong Kong Blockchain Association. So give a round of applause to Michael as well. So as I can, as I can see that uh, we will be uh, talking a bit about the crypto uh, parts as well regarding the payments. But uh, before we even jump into the obvious things, maybe you guys can tell me a bit more about that. Uh, what are you all busy with? If you can just summarize in a couple of sentences, what happened with all of you in this one and a half years during pandemic? What are you working on hard from your bedroom? <laughs> what is that, uh, uh, the new product, the new innovation, uh, what, what you brought to the Expo today? Maybe we can start with you, Mike. <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, hi, everyone. So yeah, at Expate, we do believe that uh, payment simplicity and uh, uh, high user experience. Uh, it was a really uh, great a few years for us where we had made uh, some very significant accomplishments. One of them was um, that we've um, uh, ourselves became principal members of MasterCard. We've worked hard and we've um, became acquirers ourselves finally. So that means that we not only work with um, acquiring partners, but 
acquire ourselves. We've also became SEP uh, direct uh, clearing participants, uh, which means that we can provide our customers Euro payments with individual dedicated IBANs. Uh, we've been working on our in-house developed core banking solutions, which is a very tailored industry solution, which we're really proud of. It's going to be launched very soon. Um, and um, it, it, it has been a also busy year in terms of opening new offices and fintech hubs. Uh, we've opened two offices in London and Singapore during the time. So it, it has been a great time for us. Great, lots of new things, right? And how many more things yet to come? Uh, Isaac, how about you? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Isaac Armoni. For us, it's been uh, the first word I can say is busy. Uh, 2020 and 21 has been a very, very busy years, thank God. Most of our clients are uh, e-commerce related and digital uh, related. Uh, we've seen increases in uh, 30 and 40, 50 percent in the volumes uh, of account openings and services. Um, we are always um, working on innovations, uh, meeting up with the market. Uh, Walter, while doing that, is also uh, catching up with the regu regulatory requirements, uh, which are becoming a very integral part of our businesses today. Um, I think that the play in the market today between the different companies has to do with two things. First is technology, user interface friendly, uh, the ability to work and provide services, and the second one is uh, doing that in a very safe regulatory environment and basing that on a very personal uh, customer service experience. So um, we are soon going to be launching, uh, Walter is the third largest uh, EMI in Lithuania. We also have licenses in the UK and in Singapore. We will continue to grow uh, and offer our clients more and more services. Um, soon we will, our clients will be able to buy and sell uh, cryptocurrencies through our partnerships on our platforms. Um, they will also be able to use uh, processing. Uh, we have a whole bunch of new products that are rolling in. Some of them we're gonna keep for ourselves. Uh, we'll tell them a little bit later <laughs> so we can keep the competition. Uh, but it's, uh, it's exciting, there's a lot of stuff going on. Working, working, busy, busy. Yes, it's the same here with us, uh, with PSP Angels as well. These two years, I really feel that these years were absolutely uh, amazing in terms of the online payments, right? The banking is booming, the, the, the brokerages are hitting numbers that never seen before. So it was, it was a, a blessing in the, in the unfortunate situation for the, for the online businesses to, to actually- We're explore. in the middle of a, what I call transformation from old classic banking into digital banking. That's right. So the world's contextless, digital banking, seamless accounts, um, online transactions. Today, uh, almost every fourth client doesn't go into a branch, doesn't uh, log online. He's using his phone to do transactions, to transfer money, uh, to convert currencies, to pay with his credit card. Yes. Uh, the world is changing just in front of us. We are all, I think that everybody sitting here is experiencing it. Uh, you sit in a cafe in, a, in, in an airport and you hear people yeah. in the table next to you talking about buying Bitcoin and selling and cryptocurrencies and they have a wallet and they send that it is, we're, we're all experiencing it, okay? It's not, uh, right. uh, we see today that people are, there's a, there's a huge trend of trading online. Um, people are participating in the market, so it's amazing. Exactly, exactly. How about you, Arthur? Tell us a mm. bit more. What Thank were you, you busy with? <laughs> hi guys, hi all. Look, uh, I can tell you just, you know, the small story. Uh, back in 2017, it was like four years ago already, and uh, B2B and pay company, at that time, it used to be credit card processing company. And uh, when Bitcoin hit, it, I, I, I do remember that, I will never forget this day. It was uh, 1st April, Bitcoin hit $1,000. At that day, uh, Japanese bank, they announced that uh, they issued the new regulation for virtual currencies. And at that day, uh, Bitcoin jumped from 800 or even 700 to 1,000. And it was like started some hype, you know. And uh, of course, then uh, the 
time, it was a time for ICOs and so on. But uh, September 2017, we decided to completely move from credit card processing business for our B2B in pay project to cryptocurrency processing. And uh, I glad uh, that uh, we made this decision because so far it was one of the very right decision. And uh, today B2B in pay, it's a global cryptocurrency processing company. Uh, we serve 450 corporate clients, including all the Forex brokers, broker dealers, exchanges, and uh, we do I don't know how many hundred thousand transactions every day. And uh, we see this transformation, as you said. And uh, like even three years ago, I predicted that, guys, don't waste your time. No need to fight with these banks. You know, they try to make your life complicated. So no need. Why you should fight with them? You can easily just send hundred thousand millions ten millions just through stable coins if you scare to be get affected from the volatility from the from the Bitcoin or from the other major coins so and uh, that's uh, that's why now you see we are here and we are talking about cryptocurrency payments and uh, I think it's already exist on a daily basis in our life the only one last piece left it's uh, when uh, as soon as you know uh, when i will be able to pay for coffee through 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 crypto then uh, i don't know crypto not replace but it's gonna be uh, definitely a very very important part of the life of every one of us. That's right. I couldn't agree more. We are all waiting for that moment when our grandma starts to use the crypto as well. <laughs> so how about you, Michael? Tell us a bit more about uh, what were you busy with in the okay. last few years. So hi, everyone. I, I, I say none of you guys are leaving or getting coffee, so I guess so far the panel is doing OK for now. <laughs> um, I'll start with uh, our, uh, my personal experience. Um, start with uh, cryptos, right? Um, I started off as a trader, you know, in a financial service market, you know, doing good. Start from the south side, then move to the buy side, then work as a, you know, central bank officer. You know, kind of a look at the financial market from various different uh, perspectives, right? And then um, I remember seven, eight years ago, you know, I, I kind of got bored, right? I, I kind of want to find something that is actually interesting. And then that's how we get to know blockchain technology and crypto. And I was a trader uh, by training, and then we got lucky. That's how we, you know, make our first bunk of money, right? Um, starting from 2017, uh, we actually, um, instead of just, you know, going for short-term returns, we actually built, um, try to look at this as a business, right? So we actually built a crypto exchange, uh, crypto-focused payment gateway. Uh, we launched our own spe uh, stable coins. Uh, crypto asset management. Um, for the past four or five years, um, I, I guess a lot of my, my, my friends actually come into the market and then they left, right? Because, you know, we went through the good, the bad, and the shit days, right? To the point where all my girlfriends left me because I told them I'm in crypto. So, but, you know, this round, like starting from last March, you know, the, the DeFi concept started to kick off. And, and, you know, everyone and his dogs trying to get back into this market. And then we take a pause. We think about, hey, what is the best angle to get involved? I, I am a firm believer of the uh, underlying blockchain technology. But you know, talking about this technology is going to change our everyday lives. It's going to be another maybe five, 10 years. And then payment is actually the best use case, right? It's, it's the, the, the underlying logic is very straightforward, right? You know, everything used to be on fiat and now changing to crypto. So this is nothing new. You don't have to understand the, the, the technology as long as you have a uh, digital wallet, you know how to do the transfer, and you're good to go. So that's my comments. Yeah. Great. Yes. And um, touching on the on the blockchain, that uh, it is very interesting, and and we wish that everybody would have a wallet with Bitcoin in there to spend freely. But unfortunately, majority of our clients are still using Visa and Mastercard processing. So what I get uh, requests from my clients as a payment consultants that yes, Victoria, crypto is great in the future, but get us something which is stable, trustworthy 
card processing, right? So I just want to have your opinion about that, Mike. Uh, obviously, you have a lot of application, and this is a very lucky position that we are in because there is more demand than supply. Could you give us some kind of tips and hints about uh, how to get accepted uh, easily, best way, and, and what uh, should the brokers consider when we are still talking about Visa and MasterCard processing? Definitely, and I do agree uh, that um, besides crypto, which I also agree is a very important monetary instrument these days, and it's becoming more and more popular as we see, um, still classic payment cards are uh, an instrument that's popular among a lot of customers and a lot of among a lot of retail customers for FX, CFD brokers. So getting accepted by compliances and signing up new PSPs is a tricky, um, tricky task for a lot of um, brokers these days, especially because the businesses treat it as a high-risk business in terms of its regulation. Uh, the PSPs and the financial institutions are regulated by central banks. They have certain requirements from Visa, from MasterCard. And in order to sign up new providers, um, I think uh, there are quite a some factors that need to be considered. One of them, a uh, very important one, is uh, the jurisdiction of the license that broker possesses. Uh, certainly, if we're talking about non-EU regulated or unregulated FX brokers, then it would be probably a good idea to a search for a payment service provider outside of the EU because uh, inside the EU it would be kind of tricky to get accepted. Uh, the second important thing, in my opinion, would be uh, having a legal opinion about the target markets that the broker is targeting because um, it really does help the compliance teams of financial institutions in order to get their comfort of accepting certain industry if it's targeting that or another market. So that would be also important. Uh, another thing that I would certainly recommend is uh, getting uh, all of the corporate documents in place, uh, getting them up to date, new, fresh, good quality scans, IDs, passports. So it, it, it may sound really uh, obvious, but uh, sometimes we do see a lot of applications that are really uh, unprepared and it kind of um, makes life harder for the compliance. I would also recommend um, having a proper corporate structure. I, unless it's really necessary, I wouldn't recommend using uh, nominee shareholders. It's always much better for compliance teams to see the transparent uh, corporate structure of the business once it's getting reviewed. It gives more comfort to the compliance team when they can see the UBO is not, when it's not hidden under certain compli complicated uh, corporate structuring where share nominee shareholders are used. That's, that's quite important as well. And um, last but not least, I'd say that um, the region of the, the target markets, uh, it, if you're targeting certain markets, it would be a good idea to find a local acquiring bank in that market or at least a PSP that, that is using uh, a local acquiring bank in that market because that would not only uh, help uh, you comply with uh, Visa and MasterCard inter-regional regulations, but it would also help you save fees on actual card processing because the acquiring would happen locally. Yeah, I guess that's that's some of the advice I could give to brokers. And what an advice, because many times uh, we see that uh, even, uh, it sounds a bit obvious, you know, get your paperwork in order, don't hide behind, you know, nominee, uh, even shareholders or directors. There are a lot of times when uh, when uh, our merchants are, are uh, having a hard time to actually collect these documents, but obviously they need the, <laughs> the processing yesterday. So these are very, very nice advice. I think um, I can just back it up as, um, as working with uh, multiple providers. Once you have your uh, paperwork ready and uh, the clean company structure, that is going to really take you far. But we, only, we don't only need the Visa and MasterCard. How about you, Isaac? Uh, if someone wants to open a bank account for you, what would you advise to that kind of merchant? How to get through your compliance? <laughs> Thank you. I always like to give the advice in one word. Uh, and that word is knowledge. Mm. Okay. Um, to open a bank account, I will start from the end. We have clients that open bank accounts with us with a reference letter in their hand within three to four days, okay? Everything is spotless. We have all the documents filled out, all the information that we need. Walter does an enhanced due diligence on all of its clients, okay? Provides amazing services, but 
not at the cost of compliance. Um, when the client starts to, uh, like Mike said, uh, doesn't have the proper documents, the structure is not uh, right, the information that he provides us doesn't add up, um, the UBOs don't add up, um, they didn't even do a world check on any of the people involved to make sure that they're not PEPs or have any um, uh, uh, sanctions, okay, and they're not on any list. Um, that complicates the whole process. So it is in our best interest to open the account, but we will only do, the, we will only do so when you provide us with the right documentation. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't stop there. So in the onboarding, like I said, you have to have knowledge. You have to know, have knowledge of your jurisdiction. You have to knowledge of your flows. Where are you going? What are you doing? What is your business purpose? What are you going to use the funds? Where are the funds coming from? Um, what is your business plan? What, what's, what, where's your licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, there's a whole bunch of things to think about and people just think, okay, I'm gonna start a business and be a broker and open it da, 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 and get a platform here and leads there and da, da, da. It doesn't work this way, okay? You gotta, you gotta have knowledge of what you're going to do. Um, you gotta have some employees on your team. You gotta pay some people. Um, when you are transferring these amounts of money for certain activities, uh, like marketing or leads or uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You have to have some sort of a payroll and you have to have some sort of uh, business content into these transactions. Um, the days where people could transfer money at will it doesn't, do not exist anymore. But it doesn't stop there. You have the account. Use it wisely. Mm. Um, and uh, use it wisely because today's the regulators, the Central European Bank and other banks, they do corporations. Uh, the financial uh, task units and cyber units, they are live and they're online with your transactions and with what you do. They check things like layering. They check movements from one company to the other in the same day, the same amounts and circling, et cetera, et cetera. They check a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you have to have the proper documentation for the transactions as well. So if you are doing marketing, you have to have some sort of a marketing agreement. If you are buying leads, you have to have a, uh, some you know, SEO, whatever it is that you need to have. If you are getting money from a PSP, you have to have a merchant agreement, you have to have a PSP, something. Okay? You cannot receive not one euro and not 100,000 and not 10 million without having the proper documentation. And you guys have to connect the dots and to make sure that somebody in your teams have done it before you send it to the financial institution. Because in the minute that you did, the game is over. Okay? Yes. We are not, we're not in the business of fixing documents. We're not in the business of cleaning documents. We're, not, we're just looking at the documents the way we should be looking at them. And I want to remind everybody, the financial institutions want your business. We want to help you. We want to work with you. Everybody on this panel will share the same idea with me that we are all here to do business together, but we want to do it in a very safe regulatory environment. Exactly, and now my head is buzzing of all these requirements and all these uh, documents that you need, and do you do want the size of my shoe as well? So I'm sure that that's how you can back me up, guys. That's why we are going crypto, right? So the crypto regulation obviously not being in place, it makes the client's life and onboarding process a bit easier. However, from your point perspective, when you are onboarding the client, obviously you do your own checks as well. Can you tell me a bit more about what is your requirement, how you can help the clients about getting onboarded, but not just overstress them with all these requirements. First of all, when, when we do onboarding clients, uh, we uh, actually clients, they are able to choose between two types of like merchant service. The first one, it's uh, when they choose, let's say target currency, like USDT or any other crypto, which means they everything what they will be accepting or receiving from their coins will be converted automatically into the target currency. And for example, uh, of course, like most of the coins, they choose like USDT, Tether. They can uh, actually also choose which uh, blockchain, actually it doesn't matter because uh, they can uh, withdraw or to do the payouts to their clients 
in USDT in Tether based on any blockchain. And of course, the majors, it's uh, Ethereum, Tron, and Omni. We, just, just three years ago, like 90% of USDT transactions, uh, they were based on uh, Omni blockchain. Now, all of them, they moved to Ethereum, let's say 95%, and now they started moving to Tron and to Binance Smart Chain. So if they chose, let's say, uh, target currency crypto, then requirements for onboarding a bit less. But we still do the full, full compliance procedure. So because KYC, KYB procedures, you cannot deny you must to perform that, you must perform that, such activities. Otherwise, the, any uh, regulator or also, you know, we, we, we very frequently receive different requests from different like authorities, bodies, and they ask about these transactions or that transactions because don't forget that blockchain, it's a super transparent system and anybody can uh, track trace and identify like the sender and receiver and especially now all these companies and uh, we use couple of them like crystal chain analysis uh, and uh, cyber trace like there are now on the market a lot of such companies and they do kyt know your transactions and there you can uh, check transactions and basically like let's say 60% of all those transactions, what you can find there, uh, they are going from or to exchanges. Right. But all exchanges, the, all the uh, addresses all ex of exchanges, they, they are known. And uh, the crystal chain analysis and all other QIT companies, they know all the wallets hold, uh, cold and hot wallets of all those exchanges. So that's why that's why we perform 100% the almost uh, full QIC procedures. But for clients who, let's say, chose settlement or target currency as a fiat, so we apply the all standard, uh, very high, very high standard procedures. Because if you deal, if your merchant deal with fiat currency, especially through crypto, so it's a uh, for you, it's, uh, it's even uh, more uh, like high risk. And of course, we also pay attention on the type of activities. If it's, let's say, just e-commerce company, they sell, I don't know, phones or refrigerators. Yeah, of course, like you have to apply also the uh, certain uh, compliance requirements, but mm, you can't compare them to forex business or especially to gambling or casinos. Yeah. So that's why, yeah, so that's why you cannot avoid that. Mm. Still, if you are in the crypto processing, you must perform KYC. Yes. Otherwise, otherwise the, the, all these uh, KYT companies, they will just blacklist your addresses if you will start uh, washing something which is not <laughs> right. Agreed, agreed. And obviously we have to look at the future and then consider all the regulation which yet to come, but it's not there yet. So we can be always ahead of the, uh, of the Now it looks like self-regulation. So you follow yes. the just uh, standard rules, just exactly. normal business practice. And That's especially true. it's like US market, they don't have like super specific regulation. They issued like general regulations and then every company, they adjust their business model and they right. write down their own regulation based on the general regulation. Right. How is the situation at your end with VGPay, Michael? Uh, actually, um, like from, from where, are, where we came from, right? We're actually, you know, based in Asia. Uh, very familiar is the Asian market. Actually, in terms of the uh, payment PSP industry, there's actually no PSP industry in Asia, right? So the dynamics are actually completely different. You know, here is, uh, you know, license holder, you know, do KYC. Or in Asia, it's actually very flexible, you know, uh, and a lot of outside, uh, thinking outside the box thing, right? You know, um, like for VG Pay, we actually have uh, two uh, services. One is we provide this uh, fiat uh, uh, service, another is a 
pure crypto service, right? So we actually we're seeing more and more uh, clients moving very fast from fiat to crypto. So so you, if you think about pay, payment, is actually just like a traffic gateway, right? It doesn't really matter like you are you 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 you're linked to fiat or crypto as long as you are open. That opens the doors for all the traffic, right? Right now, we're actually not in a traditional forex business or crypto business. It's actually, we're in a business to fight for traffic, right? A lot of um, you know brokers or a lot of merchants, they 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 used to have stable fiat uh, gateways, but given the macro pictures, you know uh, you know onshore, for example, onshore China. Uh, regulators, right? They don't actually allow FX, like for, uh, overseas the FX uh, CFD trading, right? So there's actually no proper ways for you to deposit as a client, right? So it's a very active OTC and a C2C market. You know, we're seeing around like 20 to 30 uh, uh, do million dollar size going in and out every day. And it's true for most of Southeast Asian countries. For example, like Korean, uh, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Singapore. So. So um, another example is that we onboarded a client uh, about like six months ago, right? They're doing decent size for a deposit every day. And uh, after we explain, you know, how we can help them to, you know, to, um, to enable the uh, crypto uh, payment, we're saying 30 to 40 uh, volume where they used to run on fiat now all move to crypto. So this is the, this is the I, I guess, the, what's happening on the market for now. Right, yes, it's very interesting. And I think, Mike, you're also strong in uh, Asia. Is that something that you experience as well? Uh, well, yes, yeah, certainly. Certainly, we do, uh, we do experience that as well. And we also see um, a lot of interesting trends in terms of uh, cryptos going on, and especially wh where they meet uh, the classical fiat um, uh, businesses. So uh, for us, it's for a car processing company um, that offers their services to crypto businesses as well, uh, it's important to understand the, the risks and it's very interesting task for us and the mission for us to build a bridge between those two parallel worlds that are trying to coexist today in, in, in this reality. Um, yes, and that's quite challenging. Yes, I can imagine. Yes, the, it looks like that this payment industry is nothing else but challenges nowadays, but this is what we are here for to, to make our, uh, our clients' lives easier. Go on, Isaac. I, I do want to say something about cryptocurrencies. I think that um, cryptocurrencies are here to stay. I think it's the future. Um, there are some platforms where you can uh, buy uh, Zara to crypto or coffee in Starbucks. The situation we are in is we are seeing international forces where governments are slowly starting to understand that they're losing power with cryptocurrencies. Uh, if they could uh, um, have power over uh, foreign exchanges, uh, prices of gold, um, all these historical old uh, um, tools that used to dominate the market. Um, if uh, a certain country needed to up the oil prices, they would start a war or invade a c another country. Um, in the cryptocurrencies, it takes out all of these elements. So some of these uh, um, rulers over the world, they're not really happy with what's going on. So that's what we're seeing, and that's why we see announcements from governments that they're not supporting this or that. I think that the only way that this will push forward is if, um, like Arthur said, we are going to implement into the cryptocurrency world elements of compliance and identification and anti-money laundering, because cryptocurrency is sometimes associated with money laundering. Uh, and is, def is, is used by um, a lot of groups and uh, uh, let's say uh, people that are not, shouldn't be using it. We all, we're all in the same idea that we don't want to be part of that. That's not what we're here for. But we do want to be in this world where you can um, have a few cryptos on your wallet and they give you a certain yield and you can go to the store and buy with them. Um, and you identify and you pay taxes and et cetera, et cetera, you, you know, there's, there's so many elements to a payment today. It's not just uh, the KYC or KYB or uh, source of funds or uh, that there's also tax evasions and stuff like that. So the more clean the system is, the easier the work is. Um, and we have seen industries which move towards cleaning up their act. 
and there are amazing industries. If you take the gaming industry, for instance, they're licensed, they're working, they have legal opinions, like Mike said. Uh, they do KYC and KYB. They process, they don't have that many chargebacks, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think their activities are cleaner. So the cryptocurrency needs to move into that space, and the more it's gonna move into that space, it's gonna be easier for the providers. Um, right now, it's a little bit hectic. There's so many forces around the world that are pulling in different directions. PayPal is announcing that it's going to uh, uh, allow Bitcoin, and then the U.S. government uh, uh, comes. Uh, China is coming out with uh, announcements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, we will continue to see this fluctuation in the market and the volatility. But in the long run, in five years from now, we're going to sit here and we're going to say. Bitcoin to Zara, and you're going to laugh. It's going to be, what? This is history. This is in the past. So I think so. Yes, and uh, if you think about it, whatever is the benefit, usually that's the downfall as well, because it's easy to use. That's why it's not very safe, because there is less regulation. That's why the regulator doesn't like it. So whatever is the benefit, now we have to consider the, the consequences on, on that as well. But if you we over-regulate crypto, it's just going to become another Visa and MasterCard with all the regulations, all the European regulation and the banking. So is it really that we want? Yes, but no. <laughs> so and exactly, yeah. I just wanted to add, sorry to interrupt, I just wanted to add that Cryptos here are not to uh, avoid regulation, totally not. Uh, you know, the idea of having, and the benefits of using crypto as a payment method is also not avoiding regulation. And once uh, businesses stop thinking about crypto this way, it becomes much easier for everyone, including themselves, because crypto has many more benefits, such as smart contracts, such as transparency, as Arthur mentioned, and, and, and many more vast, huge, uh, enormous advantages uh, that are today's reality, but it's certainly not the, the unregulated uh, question. It's going to be resolved someday, right? And it's going to be regulated, and uh, we do not have to think about crypto that way. I want to say that it's a it's a question of balance. I always call it. Um, the minute that we're going to get to get to that equilibrium where where the regulation and the quickness. The, the fast payments, the instant, the, the crypto to Zara, all of this is happening in a, in a regulatory safe environment. When we reach this balance, this is where we want to go with the cryptocurrencies and open banking and the blockchain. Uh, it makes the system more efficient, quicker. It will allow us to develop more products and services. And at the end, the end message is that the cost of this will be cheaper for the end user. So that's what we're trying to do to make the market more efficient. Yeah, I agree with <clears throat> all colleagues. Uh, but you know what I want to say is that many people think that uh, crypto is completely freedom. And uh, since Bitcoin hit 60K, many traders and, and just holders, uh, they, they don't Bitcoin, uh, they don't use Bitcoin as a Payment, payment assets. They use Bitcoin as an investment asset in mostly of the uh, cases. And uh, since that time, the, a lot of transactions, that's why we see the huge growth in terms of stable coins. Mm, take a look on the USDT, 52 billion capitalization. USDC, first regulated stable coin, 14 billion. They launched this, this coin uh, October 2018, so two and a half years, 14 billions. So, and uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, all these regulated tokens, uh, unregulated tokens like uh, Tether, so it's a centralized tokens based on decentralized blockchains. What does it mean? It means that, and, and there are so much cases already, uh, the potentially the people who control these tokens and smart contracts, they already blocked and they might block any of our or your or any user address. So, and they already did it, which means, so the, the, the people think that uh, crypto is completely freedom, but it's not. And eventually uh, the regulators, what they carry, the key, Care really about it's the only the all the participants all the players all the 
payment providers, cryptocurrency exchanges, brokers, they have to perform QIC. After that, uh, the every single address uh, will be identified. And, and, and uh, what all, uh, the, 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 all the regulators, they just care about that. So that's why uh, I think we will see bright regulated future in crypto uh, 100% because uh, otherwise, you know, on, in this field, uh, it might appear so many frauds and all stuff like that. So that's why, that's why we believe that uh, the, the regulation is coming and it's already here. They all the uh, countries, they even started uh, talking or some of them, they already implemented uh, central bank digital currencies. And it's the same like a regulated stable token. It's a centralized token based on decentralized blockchain. Yeah. But in the CBDC case, it's going to be even centralized blockchain. Yes. And uh, uh, if, if sorry, go on. Uh, let me echo what was what said earlier, right? Because, you know, oftentimes, right, a lot of people first get to know uh, block crypto digital assets because of the volatility, right? You know, there's no single uh, asset class that has such a high volatility, right? Like two days ago, right? We're seeing like 40% move on a market, right? And, and you think is, is, you know, we say a 2% move on FX, everyone's like, woohoo! But 40%, that's what you get. And uh, two years ago, we say an 85% move on a single day, right? So that's the volatility. Start, a lot of people start to look at this as an alternative asset class. But a lot of people start to use it, not for pointing, speculating, but through stable coin, right? So this is actually where this is relevant, right? It's through payment, right? I, I actually, I don't know like how many of you guys actually hold a uh, crypto wallet or hold any cryptos. Okay, no, it's, don't, don't be shy, you know, it's fine. You know, Everyone so, in the so room. Like we are all in, in this industry and we want to embrace the regulators, right? But we need everyone to get involved, right? By download a crypto wallet, start, you know, not just by, BTC, right? Buy a stable coin and, you know, get a feeling yourself. And then you realize that actually this is something that's good, right? Um, like, for example, in Asia, right? We, uh, I, a lot of my friends, right? They don't, they don't have a bank account, right? For, for example, in Sing Singapore, um, around 80% of people don't have a bank account, let alone credit card. They never even know what is a credit card, but I have a crypto wallet. And they're already using that every day, right? Like, we build crypto uh, ATMs where people can just you know go over there get cash so so it's, it's a lot of things happening but when I first come here right um, I come here last November I was at a JTAX conference right and there's a lot of people saying what do you do I'm like crypto and then they just left right so I, I feel like you know this region is a little bit behind the curve but you know it's never too late right because because the world is changing so so if there's only one thing you guys think about it right, I just act so Yes, and uh, we all remember this old story when the lady put the cat in the microwave and since then the microwave producers have to put it on the terms and conditions and the user guide that don't put the cat in the microwave. So I think we are uh, seeing the same situation here with the crypto as well, that we have to go through all the scams in the book again and again. We had to have the Ponzi scheme, we had to have the pyramid scheme, we had to have the volatility uh, the riders on top and, and then the regulator realized that, that yes, okay, you cannot do that, oh, okay, you cannot do that, you, you cannot do that either. And then a uh, couple of years need to pass by until we all have a common understanding of how to make the most out of this in the best way, in the safest way, and the most important is that how can we serve the, the interest for the end user. Um, we have very short time left. Uh, I just want to ask one sentence from you. Where do you see uh, the company and your products in let's say in a year's time please keep it short within one sentence so we can give the space to other speakers as well coming up sure a uh, few words automized tailored payment solution that gives user simplicity and enjoyable user experience great uh, digital banking instant payments uh, quick digital user interfaces uh, I think that we're here and we are going to be better. <clears throat> Guys, who integrated crypto payments into your business? Who started accepting crypto? Raise your hands. 
What we gonna do? We gonna help the rest people to start accepting crypto. Great. Yeah, we are your day-to-day uh, -day crypto payment partner. Great. Oh, so one one thing is that um, you know we're actually also you know actively looking for reliable, capable partners in this region. So. Perfect. So I think we are all working towards the same goal. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. If you would like to have any questions uh, for us, we are all available after the panel. So we are very happy to, to have uh, a chat with you and uh, enjoy the rest of the expo. Thank you very much.